and welcome to another episode of Nostalgic Mystery Radio. I'm your host, Stevie K, and it's my honor to bring you the radio shows of yesteryear. For today's episode, I bring you Philip Marlowe in The Unfair Lady, originally aired June 4th, 1949, where Marlowe goes south of the border to find out who is behind a series of diamond thefts. So sit back and relax, and I hope you enjoy this Nostalgic Mystery Radio. Thank you for listening. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end. But they never learn. Let me give you an example. I was hired to find a thief, and I did, a thousand miles from home. But first I found a lush with a luger, a fresh corpse in the closet, and all because the only woman in sight wouldn't play fair. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Unfair Lady. The knock on my office door was soft, almost apologetic. So when I mumbled come in, I was ready for something delicate and about as self-effacing as Uriah Heep. But when the door swung open, I knew exactly how wrong I could be. The gentleman was maybe 40, gray at the temples with shaggy eyebrows and a military mustache, and built like a heavy cruiser with a pair of catcher's mitts for hands. I'm Elliot Florey, Mr. Marlowe, Mr. Ira Bjornson's secretary. Are your services available, sir? That all depends on what you and Mr. Bjornson want me to do, Flory. What's the job? Well, specifically, sir, to catch a thief. Hmm. May I sit down, please? Oh, of course. Thank you. Mr. Bjornson is being robbed systematically of diamonds. Are they disappearing from Astorians, or is somebody robbing his wife? No, 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 Mr. Marlowe. You see, sir, Mr. Bjornson owns and operates the Bjornson Mines, the relatively new but important deposit of Kimberlite Pipe. Kimberlite asked... which? Kimberlite Pipe, Mr. Marlowe. Oh. Geological term of the diamantiferous blue ground which yields the minerals. Oh, oh of course, diamantiferous. Mm. Well, last November, sir, the 21st to be precise, you worked for Mr. Craig Norton, a mining engineer who lived here in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. He recommended you to my employer. Now, Mr. Marlowe, will you take the job? I don't know. You still haven't said anything about the stealing itself. Is it a Bjornson representative here in Los Angeles who's coming up minus? It's Mr. Bjornson himself who's being robbed, Mr. Marlowe, at the mine proper. Oh, I see. And he wants me to, uh... Yeah, oh, wait a minute. This mine, this diamond mine, wouldn't be in South Africa. <laughs> no, sir, it wouldn't. It's uh, at Rislo. It's a hamlet a hundred miles south of Nogales. South of where? Nogales, Mr. Marlowe. is a city in Arizona, a few hours' drive from Tucson at the Mexican border. Oh, now, look, Mr. Flory, I'm a private detective in the city of Los Angeles who's at home in a... In a barn, a back alley, or sometimes uh, with a blonde. Not in rural Mexico, is that clear? Oh, yes, sir, perfectly. Also, it's something that Mr. Bjornson anticipated. I refer to your reluctance to make the trip, sir. To Mr. Bjornson in Rislo, Los Angeles, is the nearest metropolis where a dependable private detective could be found. To you in Los Angeles, Rislo is a new world. Therefore? Therefore, Mr. Marlowe, these papers. The first is your plane reservation, De Lux Passage, leaving tonight for Nogales, where you will be met and chauffeured across the border to Rislo. You know, you tossed that off like it was transferring from the red bus to the E-car downtown. It's less complicated, sir, I'm sure. It is? Now, these other papers, Mr. Marlowe, are both checks, each for $500. One is your fee, the other for expenses, not including your air travel. Your decision, sir. Oh, well, my decision, Mr. Florey, is that for 500 bucks plus, Rislow is plenty cosmopolitan for me. I'll go. You'll go. I'll go. At eight the next morning, we dropped gently out of the clear sky over Nogales, where I was met by a short, round Mexican who ushered me into a car labeled Bjornson Mines and suggested that I sleep for the next three hours, which was the travel time to Rislo, 100 miles south. So after 30 minutes of panoramic dry, sandy hills and occasional cactus, I did. When I woke up again, it was better than noon, hotter than Hades, and we were parked at a filling station in Rislo itself, which could have passed for home if you happened to be a prairie dog. 
It wasn't until I had my eyes wide open that I realized that the man leaning on the running board inches away and staring at me like my eyebrows were on upside down was not my driver. He was shaggy hair all around an unshaven, unpleasant face that was home to a pair of watered eyes that said he was drinking himself to death. And when he talked, I knew it was on cheap <laughs> rum. <laughs> you're the new mining engineer, maybe? Yeah, I didn't know it showed. <laughs> Since you're an American, that means you got to be an engineer. Oh. No other Americans come out this way. I'm an American myself, you know, from uh, Philly. <laughs> Good old Philly. Yeah, it's a great town. <laughs> What's for sale, hot transits? <laughs> no. No, it's just being friendly. Mm. Name's Calder. M.J. Calder. Uh, I'm staying over at the Granada Hotel for a while. Be, uh, first floor rear. Uh, why don't you look me up some night? Any night along about eight. I used to be an engineer myself. Might chew fat a while. Um. Yeah, yeah, we might do that. So, well, I'll look forward to it. So long, pal. When my driver and I were back on the hot dirt road, I was told the Bjornsson mine was the open pit type a deep hole about a half mile in diameter in the middle of the Bjornsson property, which was clearly circled by 11 miles of eight-strand barbed wire fence, which was guarded by 50 ex-GI Mexicans who were under the iron fist of one Captain Juan Lufino. Twenty minutes later, when we entered the main gate and were slowly driving up a neatly landscaped white pebble road, we got a different picture of life at the Bjornsson mines. It was the residential side, plush and strictly Beverly Hills, and the sprawling red brick house past the green and white tile swimming pool to the guest house beyond. Inside, I found the multimillionaire himself. It was a bald 50 perspiring and shaped like a bowling pin. At 10 o'clock last night, Marlow, it happened again. $5,000 worth of stones. The seventh robbery in as many weeks, excluding, of course, the usual trickle. The usual trickle? One or maybe $2,000 worth a month. That's stealing nobody can stop. The natives, the guards, visitors, everybody. But most of them we catch, Marla, because in the first place, our policing is very thorough. Mm. And second, to steal a rough diamond is one thing, but to get rid of it is something else again. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, tell me, Mr. Bjornson, these big thefts you're concerned about, do they all have anything in common? Yes. Two things, Marla. They always occur at night, and they are the work of somebody who knows my habits and has a good knowledge of the inside of my house. The big safe is never bothered. It is always some drawer or cabinet where I am keeping stones temporarily. I see. And, Mr. Bjornson, has anybody ever seen this thief? Last night, Helen Austin saw what could be the man running through the grounds at about 11 o'clock. She said he was tall with a lot of wavy hair. Mm -hmm. She uh, said that he was not the Mexican. Oh, by the way, Marlowe, Mrs. Austin and her husband are staying in the guest house where you will be put up. He works for you, Mr. Bjornsson? No, Kelly Austin has a mine of his own about five miles from here. Smaller than ours, but rich, nevertheless. Oh, this will be Captain Lufino. Mm. <laughs> Don't mind if he appears unfriendly, Marlowe. He considers your presence here a personal insult. <laughs> <laughs> Come in. You wish to see me, Senor Bjornsson? Yes, Lufino. This is... Mr. Marlowe, the detective. Ah. When Senor Flore came back this morning, Senor Marlowe, he spoke very highly of your reputation in Los Angeles. Mr. Flore only talked to my friends in Los Angeles, Captain. Oh. Now, Mr. Bjornson, you were telling me about the Austins. Yes, they have been with us for two or three months now while their new house is being constructed at their own mine. Their last place burned to the ground. I would suggest, Marlowe, that you speak to her as soon as possible. Also, the captain here will tell you of some evidence that he found here on the ground last night. No, senor. It turned out to be nothing. What kind of nothing, captain? Uh, a fountain pen, yes. Uh, it belonged to one of the office workers. Uh, senor Barnes. Yes? Did you tell him about that nut Campbell? Oh, no. Uh, Marla, the International Diamond Exchange keeps us advised of the movements of the bigger black marketeers whenever possible. Three days ago, we were told that a man named Nat Campbell, an American who was at one time an engineer, has been operating in Mexico close to the border. Is there an accurate description of him? No. Anything else you have to know, Captain Lufino will take care of you. Also, I am sure that the captain will be glad to show you to your room at the guest house. Sir, it will be my pleasure to assist Senor Marlowe in any way I can. This way, Senor, please. <laughs> Mm. 
Captain Lufino's interpretation of assist was to hand my suitcase to a boy, point a thick thumb in the general direction of the guest house, and disappear. So after thanking him for his trouble, I went to my room, unpacked, changed into a dry shirt, which was damp again in three minutes, and then started for the suite on the opposite side of the building, where I'd been told I could find Helen Austin. But when I was halfway to a screen door, I stopped at the sound of a raised voice that I'd heard before. It was Mr. Elliot Florey who was about to leave and unhappy about the whole thing. When I was close enough to see Mrs. Austin, I could also see why. The lady was blonde deeply tanned, just a shade off beautiful and almost dressed in a white linen shorts with halter to match. I told you last night, why you... behaving like a fool. Oh, am I? Well, you just wait a bit, my dear. We'll see who the fool is around here. Oh, yes, we... Marlo, what are you doing out there? Calling on Mrs. Austin. Why? Do I need a visa, Flory? No. No, Mr. Marlo. You don't need a visa. You don't need anything. Well, come in, won't you? Elliot was just leaving. Uh, yes, I... I have to be running along. I'll see you later, Helen. I can't wait. Well, sit here, Mr... Uh, it's Phil, isn't it? Phil Marlowe? Mm-hmm. Nice name. You know, Phil, I don't often get to see a new face around here, so anything I can do for you will be a pleasure. <laughs> I'm sure the pleasure will be all mine. But uh, aren't you afraid you'll catch cold? Why? Don't you like this? Uh -huh. I made it myself. I do most of my things, you know. These are styles are too far behind New York to suit me. My husband, Kelly, says I'm clever. Better than that, Helen. Kelly, what? You're resourceful. <laughs> you startled me. Uh, darling, this is Philip Marlowe. I know. Ira told me you were with us, Mr. Marlowe. Can I be of some help, possibly? No, not at the moment, Mr. Austin. Right now, I'm only interested in knowing if your wife here can add anything to a description of last night's stranger. Can you, Mrs. Austin? Why, no. If there were anything else outstanding about the man, I certainly would have told Ira. No doubt. But uh, what about the run-of-the-mill things? His dress, the way he walked? Like most men, Marlowe, we wore one pair of pants, one shirt. He had only one head. Also, like most men, he smelled of liquor. Rum, maybe? We all drink rum here. How about joining us in town? After dinner? Long about eight? Thanks, but uh, long about eight, I've got to be back in Rislow to see Mr. Calder. Ever hear of him, Austin? Uh, why, no. Should I have? I don't think so, no. He'd have very little in common with you people, with one exception. Which is what, Phil? Yeah. Rum, Mrs. Austin. He's crazy about it. After I left Kelly in what with one healthy cloudburst ad, it would make a great Sadie Thompson... I found Ira Bjornson and told him that I thought last night's stranger, one M.J. Calder and Nat Campbell, could be all one and the same. And that I would like to go into Rislow and check on just that, which suited him fine. So after apologizing for having just let Captain Lofino go off the evening in his car, he gave me the keys to a battered station wagon and wished me good luck. Four hours later, when it was dark and I was in Rislow and walking the dirty length of the ground floor corridor of the Granada Hotel, which was darker, I had a feeling I was going to need it. Marlowe called her, the new man at Bjornson's mine. Oh, fine. Be right with you. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't expect you to take me up so soon. Yeah, well, you know the mines, Campbell. One's just as dull as the next, huh? That's right. Did you... What did you call me? Campbell. That's it, isn't it, Nat? No. The name's Calder, M.J. I told you that today. Yeah, and at the time I believed you, good old Philly included... Come on, Rummy, uncover the masquerade's over. Open up while you still can talk. What do you say? Uh, okay. Okay, ain't the biggest secret in the world. Here, sit down. For key! Why, oh, you lousy lush! You don't aim any better than you lie! Uh, I know. I had enough, I tell you. All right, we'll see. Now, come on, get up. We'll start all over again after we check you once. Yeah. The kind usually has a nasty luger tucked away someplace. All right. Now, what do you know about... Hey, Campbell, that stuff over there seeping under the closet door. The color isn't right for rum, brother. It's too red. Well, Captain Lufino. Yeah, he's dead, Milo. <laughs> so don't move. You'll be right with him. Yeah, you see, I was right, Campbell. Your kind always has a nasty luger someplace. 
Marlowe, I didn't do that. I didn't kill him. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. He committed suicide in your closet and closed the door as a gag, I suppose. That's enough. I don't try to be funny. I didn't even know he was here. I was out. When I come back, I found him. Campbell, that line retired with a flintlock rifle. If you hadn't parboiled your brains in fusel oil, you'd realize it. But it's the truth. I'll tell you what the truth is, cousin. Lafino had a piece of evidence that tabbed you as being out of Bjornson's mind last night at 11 o'clock. But he passed it off as a fountain pen that meant nothing because he resented me honing into his territory. Then he came here alone to put a pinch on you and get the credit. Only you dropped him instead. That's a lie. And I can prove it by the best witness in Mexico, next to Bjornson himself. Who are you talking about? One, Mr. Elliot Flory, that's who. I was in the Cafe Kilota last night at 11. And Flory saw me there. No dice, Campbell. Flory didn't get in from no galleys until this morning. <laughs> You're pretty seedy for a big city boy. Yeah? Man. You can check the bartender at the cafe and see if I'm not right. But right now, I'm going to put you away so I can get out of here. I turn around and walk slow. Out the back way and down the stairs. Go on, Move. What are you going to make my murder look like? Robbery? Don't act so brave. You'll live because I figure you'll clear me one way or another, whether you like it or not. Now, hold it. That's far enough. Now, open that cellar door. Okay. When you get out, don't waste time looking for me. I won't be around. So long, countryman. Don't hurt yourself. <coughs> oh, no! Cellar was as light and wholesome as a Parisian sewer. Even with the help of several generations, termites, it took a half an hour to break out. When I got upstairs again, it was deserted except for the late Captain Lufino. I went through his pockets, but they held nothing more exciting than battered cigarettes and some small change, but under the tight sash around his waist was a small green suede pouch containing three minute diamonds in the rough. I began to see what Bjornson meant by the usual trickle. Everybody, including the chief of his own guards, seemed to be in on the act. I dropped the pouch in my pocket and headed for the Kilota Cafe, where two American bucks and a nasty snarl of the bartender brought me the fact that Elliot Flory actually had been there last night. Had waited two hours for somebody who didn't show up. And then left. That made my next stop the mine. So I bounced the station wagon out of town, back to Bjornson's house, and started in. But a pair of bare shoulders above a snug linen halter intercepted me. Hello. You're back safe, I see. Enjoy all the sights in our filthy, stinking little town? Not much, Mrs. Austin. You should have taken me along as a guide. I could show you lots of interesting things. Mm. Like what, for instance? Like the sky and the moon. I like things clean and soft. I like lights and music and people. <laughs> I like you, Mother. Save it. That buttons and bows routine is strictly your own problem. I've got work, and it starts with Elliot Flory. Where is he? What makes you think I'd know that? Because you two have been keeping close track of each other for some time. You're anxious to drop it, but Flory isn't. And now he's got a hold over you, and you're worried silly. Well, and you skip did... that, too. From what I know, I can fill in a very unpleasant yawn, and I will if I have to. So come on, baby, no dramatics. Let's have it. Where's Flory? Marlo, you're a louse. But if that's you, better than he is. Went over to our place of mine about half an hour ago. I don't know why he wouldn't tell me. Just wanted me to keep my mouth shut and left. That doesn't make sense. Where's Mr. Austin? My good husband is off somewhere checking on supplies, he says. Okay, I'll pay a call on Flory right now. When I get back, baby, I'll have a lot of answers. So I advise you to wait up, huh? Sure. When you're all through with him, do me a favor, will you, Mr. Tough Detective? What, throw him back? No, kill him. After she said it, she stared at me for a moment and then turned and walked away. And from the bitterness in her face, I figured... She had more on her mind than she told me about. But as I beat it around to the driveway where I'd left the station wagon, climbed in and wheeled out the gate, I forgot about theories and headed for the Kelly Austin mine and a big scale diamond thief as fast as the rutted road and loose body bolts would permit. I'd barely gotten out of sight of Bjornson's house where from somewhere out of the truckload of shadows I was hauling in the rear end of the station wagon, the muzzle of a gun was shoved hard against the back of my neck and held there. Pull over and stop, Mr. Marlowe, but don't take your hands off the wheel. Austin, you're off your rocker. You've been working too hard. Not so hard that I didn't get back in time to see you kissing my wife. You don't deny it, do you? Well, for what it's worth, you got your subject backward, but never mind don't that. Don't turn around, Marlowe. I'm sorry about this. I liked you when we met today. Now, listen. We'll take this up later in detail. 
Right now, I'm after a guy who's been biting into Bjornson's diamonds, and I'm sure it's his own secretary, Elliot Florey. Florey? Well, that's absurd. Yeah? And what's more, he's currently up to something cute at your mine. He's at my mine, Florey? That's what I said. Now, after I've seen him, Buster, I'll be indignant with you all night if you like. You're a clever liar, Marlowe, but it won't work. You're not getting out of this that easily. I'm going to tell Bjornson what you've done, but first, you cheap masher, I'm going to get some satisfaction out of you personally like this! Oh! <laughs> First, first one, one side of my head and then the other exploded like Roman candles. I fell a long way out of the car door to the road. When I finally stopped falling and started back to my feet. I had a double handful of Mexico in my mouth. All the rest of it I could see looked big and black and deserted. The station wagon was gone and so was my enthusiasm. And the picture of Marlo on foot in the middle of the Mexican mountain looked pretty stupid. I trudged back toward the house. I stopped as a pair of headlights swung out the gate and slashed down the road at me. Came to a sandstorm halt. Marlo! Marlo, what happened to you? It's a long story, Mrs. Austin. The less you hear about it from me, the better for all of us. What do you mean? That Kelly, your husband, was watching when you wanted to show me the Mexican sky and the moon. Up there at the house. It was just a teensy bit irate about it. Oh, is that all? That's enough. What about Flory in the mine, Marlo? How should I know? When I got tangled up as a heavy in this corny gaslight melodrama, I... You, Wait a minute, did you, did you put that jacket on since I saw you last? No, what's the matter? Come over here in the light. Come on! <laughs> sure. Now listen, Helen. You told me once sewing was your hobby. Did you happen to make this item yourself? Yes, Simon. Eddie. What's so important about uh -huh. that? Aren't you long shot, but if it pays off, I'll catch both a killer and a diamond thief. I'm going to borrow your car, beautiful. Wait a minute. I'm coming with you. No, you're not. I've got to get Florian and stop a murder, and that takes a different kind of speed than you've got. So long, baby. With every jolt of the car, another Roman candle went off in my head, but I kept the gas pedal jammed to the floor until I saw the turnoff sign for the Austin mine. Then I cut the lights and pulled over. It was 400 yards up the side road to the gate where a Mexican sentry in a battered sombrero leaned against a post on a barbed wire barricade. I skirted him and followed a path outside the fence until I found the landmark I was looking for. There was another sombrero, and a few feet away, sprawled out, sleeping soundly from a blow on the back of his head, it was its owner. Two strands of the barbed wire had been cut. So I crawled through and up to the edge of the big pit. It looked black and bottomless until a tiny flicker of light down deep inside winked on for an instant and then went out again. That was my cue. But I was 15 tooth and nail minutes playing mountain goat on tiptoe down 150 vertical feet of ladders and catwalks before I was near the bottom and close enough to hear a pick biting hard clay. When it stopped suddenly, so did I. And listened with my 38 clenched in my hand. But Flory had been surprised by someone from the bottom of the pit, not by me. Austin! Austin, how did you... No, no, no. Don't shoot, Austin, please. Why not, Mr. Flory? You found what you were looking for, didn't you? Didn't you? Yeah. Yes, I did. And what precisely did you find? That my mind has run out? That it's worthless? That I've kept it going only with stolen diamonds? That's right. I suspected it. Now I know. You're the one who's been stealing from Bjornsson. You bring the diamonds here, you salt your own ground with them, and then remine them as fresh stone. And get the full market price, yes. But what do you hope to achieve with this information now, Mr. Florey? You realize that I have to kill you? No, wait. Wait, I... I have nothing against you, Kelly. In fact, I have a proposition to offer you. You're in a poor position to bargain, but go ahead. Now, you'll never get away with killing me. Won't I? Here. I got away with one murder, Bruno. He would have found out about me eventually because I made a mistake last night. But that sock Campbell will take the blame for him. And right now, you're just another trespasser, so make your offer. Make it good. Go on, go on. All right. I... I promise you, no one will ever know about this. If you'll get out of Mexico and leave Helen here with me. You dirt. I'm not going to shoot you, Flory. I'm going to strangle you with my bare hands. I'm going to turn Why my you... back and let you. Uh, yeah, Mama. school's out. Drop it, Austin. Stand still, both of you. No, it's too late for that. You hit him, Marlo. You got him. I... I think he's dead. Yeah. And I got something for you, Flory. <clears throat> I hope I can get the slime off my fist. <laughs> Please, Marlo, pour yourself another here. It'll help your headache to go away. Oh, thanks, Mr. Bjornson. It's cooler out here than it was inside. It's better now, thanks. 
Uh, I don't know. I am happy and I am sad both. You found me my thief, all right, but you lost me a friend in the bargain. Mm -hmm. And the way we live out here, our friends are as dear as our diamonds. Well, there's one thing about diamonds, Mr. Bjornson. They won't go bad on you. You're right there, my boy. It's hard to realize that Kelly Austin was our man. Yeah, I imagine it is. You said it was Helen's jacket that gave you the answer. How was that, Marlowe? Well, Lufino was carrying a little green suede pouch. Mm -hmm. I thought it was his. But actually, that was a piece of evidence that he found last night. It wasn't until I saw Mrs. Austin's jacket of the same green suede that I realized the pouch must have been made from the scraps left over from the jacket. I see. And since the wife sewed the jacket herself, that made the husband the logical owner of the pouch. That's right. You know, in a way, you might say Helen's responsible for the whole mess. How do you mean, Marlowe? Well, it all adds up like this. Helen wanted diamonds bad. Her husband started stealing for her. Things went well until he almost got caught. That was last night, huh? That's right. Running across the lawn, Kelly dropped a little pouch. Lafino, who caught sight of him, followed and found the pouch with the three diamonds. But Captain Lafino thought Campbell was the thief and went to Campbell's quarters in result to force a confession out of him. Mm -hmm. Kelly followed him, killed him before he learned too much, knowing that the rum-soaked Campbell would take the rap. That Austin woman, she's got no business here in this desolation. She loves diamonds, but not in the rough. No. She wants them around that beautiful neck of hers, with big city lights bouncing off them in all directions. <laughs> but the lady wouldn't play fair to get them. Mm. She's packing now. And Mr. Flory has already left bag and baggage. Even Lufino is gone now. You know, this is going to be lonely around here, Marlowe. I couldn't prevail on you to stay over a while. No, no, Mr. Bjornson, I'm afraid not. I'd probably catch myself picking little pebbles out of every clay bank I found. The first thing you know, I'd be stuck here, too. Besides, what would Hollywood Boulevard do without Marlowe and vice versa? And the driver who was taking me back to Nogales was finally ready. And we started out of the mines. I I took a long, last look down into the gaping, dirty, lonely pit that was the Bjornsson Diamond Field. And then, as we headed north and for the border, I settled back and thought about my own diamond field. The one that stretched out for 50 miles from the San Fernando Valley to Long Beach in blazing brilliance. Yet, in its own way, I knew it was just as dirty, just as lonely, and just as tough as the pit at Rislow. But it was my hometown. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear, Betty Lou Gerson, Hans Conrad, Paul Dubov, Wilms Herbert, and Nestor Paiva. The special music is by Richard O'Rant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... She had soft brown eyes and an accent, and she came to town with a job to do. But before it was done, death had struck three times. Then she was gone. And all because of 30 drops of pigeon's blood worth 50,000 bucks. <laughs> Later this evening on CBS, you'll hear a voice saying quietly, a tortoise told a household pest, goodbye, goodbye. And M.D. said, you'll pass the test up in the sky. Those words are a magic key to $53,000 in cash and prizes. Like to take a try at it? 
Then be waiting for Sing It Again, CBS's hour-long fun fest of music, laughter, and wonderful songs later tonight on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. been a nostalgic mystery radio presentation i hope you enjoyed this episode please feel free to like and rate this podcast on your favorite app also there's a nostalgic mystery radio youtube page for your perusal to subscribe to you can contact me by emailing me at nostalgic mystery radio at gmail.com i hope you have a blessed day or evening and again thank you for listening